Hey everybody, and welcome to the second session of Star Trek Bastet. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're an actual play podcast that is role-playing using the Star Trek Adventures rule set by Modifius Entertainment. Uh, now we're interested we're running on an interesting premise that involves the themes of the journey home along with time shenanigans. But uh, don't stress if you can't stick around for the full session or if you missed the first episode because the VOD and audio only versions are available on YouTube and most of the popular podcast solutions. Um, only announcement I have this week is that obviously I'm rocking a new model right now. Uh, you'll still see my old model, Ignatrix, now and again, but uh, I figured today I got the model in. I thought I'd use it, get used to it. But uh, with that said, let's go around and uh, have everyone introduce themselves, starting with the acting captain. Hey, everyone. My name is Alex. I am the acting captain Abasi for the ship. All right. Mr. Alexio. Hey everyone, my name is Nikhil, and uh, I play Lieutenant Alexio. Mr. Droxine. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm uh, at Mind Over Brian on both Twitter and Twitch, although on Twitch it's with a zero. And I'm playing a Baylor Droxine, the Ardanian uh, lieutenant with a cybernetic arm. It hasn't come up yet, but I have one. Hmm. I have made a note. Wolf, what do you got going on? Hi, everybody. I'm Dear Wolf. I'm playing the Chief Medical Officer, Lieutenant Kalos Cater. Pleasure to be here. And certainly last but not least. Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew. I play Lieutenant Tyr Thavarin, a Bensite who was raised on Andoria. Very nice. And with that, uh, I am ELH, your Game Master. Let's go ahead and run our very quick introduction. Welcome back. So, uh, something I like doing for all my Star Trek games, especially, is having the players do an opening log. And today, that's coming from the acting captain. So, Lieutenant Abbasi, if you would take it away. Lieutenant Abbasi's personal log. Stardate. Computer, er erase previous entry and resume recording. Acting captain's log. Stardate 4525.7. It's been two days since the Bastet found herself pushed backwards in time, ending up in the year 2268. And I found myself suddenly saddled with the role of captain, thanks to an overly eager chief medical officer. If I hear him referring to me as Captain Kitty one more time. Arrival, our arrival at to this point in time was not the quietest of affairs. In working to repair the ship's systems in the wake of a Class 10 plasma storm that was initially responsible for depositing us here, Lieutenant Droxine inadvertently caused a form of a sonar ping, which may have alerted not only the station K7 of this time frame, but as well as the Constitution class USS Enterprise and the IKS Groth. I'll admit, it was such a rare treat to be able to see what could be considered one of the most influential classes of Starfleet vessels ever constructed while in active service. I'm getting ahead of myself with that, though. On Lieutenant Varissa's suggestion, I had asked her, as well as Lieutenant Alexio, to acquire the IKS Gross cloaking device. While the Bastet may be the fastest vessel in our modern fleet, and leagues more advanced than anything we may encounter here, in both terms of propulsion and weaponry, it may be all the better to avoid being seen entirely. And I do have to give credit to Lieutenant Alexio's skills, and I have a feeling I may be calling upon him to act in such a manner again. While on the topic of the cloak, while it may be a violation of the Treaty of Algeron, I have asked Lieutenant Verissa, Lieutenant Tamarochka, and Lieutenant Theveran to make sure that it's installed and running as best as we can with our systems. Thanks to a report on a prior temporal incursion here at K7, we know that the USS, USS Defiant was here in the area while we were. Having kept to monitoring from long range sensors, we did detect their disappearance, 
needless to say, how they return to their time is unavailable to us as far as we're aware. I've ordered us to depart the sector, monitoring for any reports, none of which seem to indicate that our involvement has altered much of anything, aside from frustrating one Klingon captain. And now that I've had some downtime, I've dedicated it to going over the schematics and layout of the Bastet, familiarize myself with the Prometheus class in general, and attempt to settle into the role of captain. I think that my unease at being forced into command can be sensed by some of them, particularly by L Lieutenant Raylor. I do admit, at least at this point, it seems that I have everyone's backing. I hope that I can live up to what they believe I can. In addition, as it seems my command will be here for a while longer, I've done a little research into the vessel's name. Interestingly, she was an ancient goddess of the humans, of, among many things, protection. A cat-headed woman and a protector of the home. I feel somewhat better knowing this, having our ship, our home, for however long it takes to return to our time, be named in her honor. I cannot help but think at times of everything I've read of this goddess, she sounds suspiciously similar to my own mother. Lieutenant Timorochka has requested that I report to Stellar Cartography, as well as anyone else on our small crew who's passed the Academy's Temporal 101 course. I have to say that was a rather strange course with an even stranger instructor, Professor Daniels. I've asked Lieutenant Mir to attend this as well as the symbionts insight could be invaluable here. End log. Very nice. And you may have uh, two momentum for that very nice log. So uh, we are going to resume our little story uh, with four of you uh, starting outside of temporal operations. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what temporal operations actually is. So basically, every single Starfleet vessel, at least as far as I've been able to tell, uh, has its own dedicated stellar cartography lab. Some are bigger than others. Some are actually like fully hologram equipped. You have the latter, and it's one of those things that uh, Lieutenant Abbasi, Lieutenant Cater, Lieutenant Droxine, Lieutenant Mir, as the four of you step into what used to be just stellar cartography, what you see is essentially the uh, Kerberos or the sort of X-Men bridge that leads out into sort of a holographic space. And uh, Lieutenant Tamarochka is already there. And what you see is not a display of the sector or of the stars. What you see are essentially a bunch of timelines that have been interwoven and are somewhat being tracked best they can. And uh, as you enter, Tamarochka doesn't even turn around and she says, Ah, uh, good, you are here. Um, let us begin with meeting. And uh, she ends up highlighting uh, several points in the timelines that are sort of streaming past you all and says, Well, um, you asked me to look into how we might be getting home. I have several ideas, some of which um, you may or may not like, but here they are. And uh, she shows you it is essentially an image or a holographic display of a explosion. Um, it is a blue-hued sort of detonation that you see sort of washing over a series of space. And she says, Well, um, first things first, if we do not do it right, we will cause temporal explosion, which will destroy not only local star system, but potentially further on. So we want to make sure we get it right first time. Um, my current forerun idea is this. And she shows you now an image of well, looks to be just empty space. Like you're looking and you're not seeing anything in particular. Could you perhaps elaborate, please, Lieutenant? Well, yes, of course. And uh, she presses a button and almost coming out of the ether around you is the faint outline of a sphere of a planet or maybe even a star. And she goes on to explain... Uh, this is what you would know as a uh, black star. It is a very rare astrological phenomenon, has very high gravitational attraction. It is um, one of Kirk's favorite for time travel. Problem is finding one. You basically have to be right on top of them to find it. So in other words, this is probably not a first option. 
Correct, yes. What else have you found? Well, um, since we were with uh, the Defiant recently, I was able to um, look into those logs now that you have unlocked them using your captain codes. Apparently, if we were able to get chronotons lodged in the ship's plate of armor, and we were able to polarize them, we might be able to beam through time, a, a temporal transporter, if you will. Uh, Abbas, he can, looks down for a moment, considering this, then looks back towards Lieutenant Cater. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um. So, uh, mm, I'm trying, mm, I did not do well in that course, but what I can say is that what she has said sounds very smart. Lieutenant Mir, Lieutenant Droxine, do you have anything to add? Uh, we could we could go talk to the Guardian. And Mir chips in. You you mean the Guardian of Forever? Uh, I, I mean, what other what other Guardian? Yeah, I mean, I, I, listen, the beaming through time thing that sounds really awesome. That doesn't solve the problem of having the best hat still be in the past. That would just get us to the present. And I mean, listen, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but uh, I'm pretty sure we don't want to leave a a future ship for somebody in this time frame to find and beam aboard and then fly around and destabilize the entirety of time. You know, let's just put that out there. Uh, Captain Kitty, oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Captain, uh, Captain. Um, actually, I do remember one, one statement, um, uh, uh Lieutenant, uh, Chamraka, Ch Chamraka, sorry, I'm really bad with names. Um, Tomorochka. that's what I said. So, uh, Miss, Miss Tomorochka, Captain, no, you're the Captain Kitty. Sorry. So these sons, if I remember correctly, there was some sort of, uh, timeline when Kirk went to these sons, these things that we were, couldn't we just look up when he was there and then tr like triangulate the coordinates and then just go where he was based on, I'm just talking out loud. No, I mean, that is a interesting thought you have there. Can I make a check? Like, uh, yeah, if you wanted to make such a check. Uh, yeah, I want to see, like, is there a way to cross reference based on like, the, the old Enterprise, Kirk's Enterprise's, like, coordinates when he did the time travel crap. Yeah. You can cross-reference with the star chart from that time. Like, oh, we could just go one of those places, you know? That's yeah. what Kalos just thought about. Uh, no, that's, that's a really good idea. Um, why don't you do me a reason and a science? And the ship will assist you with a computers and science. Um, uh, difficulty on this will be a three. Science sensor operations. I mean, I have sensor operations, but is this a sensor operations thing? I mean, technically, yeah, because you are trying it. to <laughs> more or less correlate where you are now to where this thing could potentially be. I got the ship. You know what? Because I like, I like a GM that has threat. I'm giving you a threat for three dice. All right. So I need to see three successes here. Ship didn't help. <sighs> Let me down. Sure didn't. Three, two, one. Let's go. Oh, so nice. bad. <laughs> Starting off solid. Starting off solid. I'm so, like, oh, that's uh, impossible. That wouldn't work. I'm sorry. I was wrong. So I think what happens is Tamarochka punches the numbers with uh, Cater's help, and it ends up being one of those things where, uh, unfortunately, either Kirk never logged it properly or um, probably one of those things where it just was never recorded in a, such a way that would work with your logs. So you have no idea. Like, you have a general area. Like, you could go to sector so-and-so. But where in the sector, you have no idea. Temeroshka, can I ask a quick question just about that, by the way, the Black Star uh, theorem? Yes, what is it? Uh, wasn't, it an, uh, wasn't it a result of the uh, warp field backlash of getting out of the... Um, the, the Black Star's gravitational pull that caused the temporal displacement? Yes, that is correct. Do we have any guarantee that modern warp bubble, uh, warp field technology won't have overcome that kind of uh, 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 result, which would mean that we would just find ourselves escaping a Black Star's gravitational field without 
any of the temporal side effects? Well, we would have to downgrade engines, yes. We would have to basically downgrade either beta or alpha section engines and run off them. But yes, it is possible. I didn't say it would be good, I just said that it was possible. Let's be clear here. And uh, it's at this point that Lieutenant Mir just kind of almost doesn't laugh, maybe just sort of chuckles to herself and goes, you know, if we're getting all the ideas on the table, uh, have we considered going to Bajor? I mean, the Orb of the Prophets, uh, the Orb of Time, uh, would still be on Bajor in 2268, would it not? Uh, you know, I, I actually don't remember most of my uh, exo xenoculture studies. Is the what's the orb of time? Um, basically, it's a um, it's an artifact that allows one to travel into the past. At least as far as I understand it. Oh, I mean, I was asking a character. Oh no, that's that's mirroring oh, character. Okay, cool. I was like, mm. oh, so but traveling into the past wouldn't help us if that's what it does. I imagine if it can go into the past, it can go into the future as well. Hey, actually, wasn't there? Did the Defiant have any records of uh, of? Um, oh no, I guess the wormhole won't be. I was gonna say, I wonder if there's any temporal phenomena in the Gamma Quadrant that we could take advantage of. But now that I think about it, the wormhole won't be stable for another well hundred and some odd years. <clears throat> But if we could get into it and convince the prophets to take us to our present time, I mean, if we're going to throw all the ideas on the table. Yeah, but with as fickle as they can be, do we want to check But that? wait, isn't, isn't Cisco one of them? So really, we just got to ask to talk to the Cisco. I don't know if that would work. I mean, if I remember the log correctly, didn't... Um, uh, what the doctor what's his name um they're not important uh, doctors aren't important um what didn't the doctor say that he had become sort of like one with the prophets which theoretically would mean he had been there the whole time but again if like you said yourself the wormhole hasn't stabilized yet we're not even going to be able to get in but the reason the wormhole well i mean the wormhole still existed that whole time didn't it it was just ships disappeared into it and then Anyway, sorry. You know what? The, obviously, I'll, totally up to you. Your judgment. I'm just saying. I just think it's still there. It just doesn't go anywhere yet. Otherwise, it, how would the prophets be watching Bajor? I'm you know, just floating it out there. It may be worth holding in a back pocket. Cool. I mean, we can't put all of the ideas in a back pocket. I have a rendezvous to make, but, you know, again, totally, totally willing to uh, trust your judgment. Captain. Captain King. I'm not. I'm not calling him that. Please don't uh, call me that. I'm sorry. It's just your. I'm sorry. <sighs> Lieutenant Tamaroska, were there any other thoughts that you had? No, not really. Aside from begging Q to throw us back in into proper time, but I don't want to deal with a Q. Do you want to deal with a Q? I don't. Wait, can you get in touch with Q? Is that like a thing we can do? No, we don't I, want to do that. I, I, I'm unless, unless we started blowing up suns, I don't think he would care. So, um, crazy idea. <laughs> no, I we are not that. blowing up sun. Okay, never mind. It seems one of the best possibilities right now may be to try and go with that first option, try and locate one of these stars and see if that method will work. Very so, good. Based on my research, uh, we do have a quadrant in which Kirk apparently time traveled. So we could head to that quadrant. Um, and I, crazy idea, but if I, if I restrict the multiphasic thermonic reciprocating couplings on the sensor array, I might be able to do like a sort of like trolling effect around the ship to scan a slightly wider area for these suns. Um, I mean, I'm not 100% sure it could work. Again, not my area of expertise, but just if we're floating ideas, you know, doctors are important too. No, and uh, Mir sort of rubs her chin in thought at that and says, hmm, 
I uh I would wager we'd probably want to uh maybe consult with Lieutenant Tavarin on that. Uh they might have some special insight based on uh what I know of their uh their expertise in computers. Uh, I think they're probably the foremost expert after me on the ship right now. I'd agree with that. Uh, let's work on that, then let's see if we can get to the general area that you figured. I'll pull the logs. You're good to work on it, sir. Captain. I'll steer, I guess. And Mira actually kind of slaps Dox, or it doesn't slap, it kind of, you know, pushes playfully Droxine's shoulder and says, well, don't be too excited about it. I mean, I'm just, oh. I, I will try to. Yes, I will go and steer. Is that is that better? Are we? <laughs> uh, it's an attempt. That's all I wanted to see. And yeah, we're gonna shift scenes now to two forward. Now, two forward is a little bit special in that it is uh, one of the only, actually, one of three lounges on a Prometheus class, at least a Prometheus class such as the Bastet. Um, it is located in the very forward section of the alpha section of the ship, which means that uh, there's not a whole lot of room. It's a very small lounge, uh, probably more designed for uh, at max five or six people. But at the moment, uh, you have Lieutenant Tavarin, Lieutenant Alexio, Lieutenant Relour, and Lieutenant Verissa are all sort of uh, enjoying a uh, nice bit of refreshment uh, before they start their day proper. And uh, as you sort of all sort of sit down and enjoy your meal, um, Relure kind of actually looks over at Tavarin and says, you, you'll have to excuse me. I, it's been hard shutting people out, but I got to ask, are you a perfectionist or just that angry? I'm not really sure. And you see, as he's off duty, um, he his posture has completely relaxed. He is very gently and easily sipping this uh, strange, almost vial of gray goo. And uh, he says, I have no idea what you're talking about, Lieutenant. I, well, and she turns to Alexio. I mean, you you, you saw him when he was on duty. You 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 saw. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, he's he's pretty tightly wound. Maybe it's whatever's in that drink. What is that Tavarin? Um, it doesn't really have a name. It's more like a kind of combination of various different liquid polymers that would probably melt your digestive tract. So just just in case you're wondering. Uh, I can rearrange my digestive tract. I mean to ask you, um, how did you get into Starfleet like that? I mean, there must have been a lot of prejudice surrounding, I, I, I mean, people like you. Oh, actually, I didn't have much of a choice. It was either Starfleet Intelligence, where I'd be risking my life for the sake of the Federation, or a menial job in Starfleet where they could keep their eyes on me, and uh, and I couldn't make, uh, I I couldn't make much trouble. Um, but yes. Um, if I were to live a civilian life, it would have had to be with a series of, of restrictions. I would have essentially been on a, a, an ending probation. Well, uh, it surprises me then that you'd even want to live in the Federation. I mean, for me, joining Starfleet Academy was the greatest privilege I could imagine. For you, it was another prison sentence. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Mr. Tavarn. Uh, but, um, well, yes. I suppose it was like a prison sentence, and uh, that's why I'm not particularly eager to get back home like the rest of you. And uh, Verissa actually speaks up and says, no, I knew. I know exactly what you mean. Coming from a similar background myself, um, I think it's fair for me to admit by now. But uh, I'm actually not Vulcan. I'm I'm Romulan, um, engineered quite heavily. But um, let's just say that I I had a similar choice. It was either 
work for Starfleet, or specifically work for intelligence, or more or less end up in um, probation, as you put it, Lieutenant Alexio? Well, uh, in a way, and I ex extend my hands and just sort of like, this whole situation, it's not particularly terrible for us, it isn't for us. No, it's, it's actually quite nice. I, uh, I oh, that's the wrong accent. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's quite nice, I find. Um, however, I do have a question for both of you. And uh, she points past you at the wall where you see that there is some form of a message uh, that has popped up on the screen. Do, um, does anyone know what that is? And Lieutenant Thavarn would set down his drink and go off to the panel to check. I'm, no, I have no idea. All right. So, Tavarin, uh, what you're seeing is that the sensors have detected a chronoton burst uh, in a nearby sector. Huh. And he will... Could he run a preliminary analysis of it? You certainly may, yeah. Uh, go ahead and roll me a Reason Science. The ship will assist you with a sensor science. Uh, difficulty on this is only a one. Okay. I will spend one momentum then. Okay. And I'm going to assume that I do not have a focus there. Don't you have sensor operations? I do not. Huh. Thought you did. But yeah, uh, three successes means that you get two momentum right back. Oh, we still need the ship, though. Let's see if the ship gets you anything. Sensor Sorry, science for that. Sensor science? I got you. Survey says, nope. all right, no help from the ship. But hey, three successes, that's still two momentum. Uh, I'm actually going to give you a handout. Uh, what you are going to see um, is the following. Oh, got to erase that. There we go. Assign it to Tavarin. You should see a handout named Database Aza. So uh, as Tavarin is reading over that, uh, Barissa kind of looks over to Alexio and goes, So do you want to bet Temporal Anomaly or something that we're going to have to go fix? Mm. Or both. Well, that's a I hard suppose. one because it could be both. I, I, you know what? Now that I've said it, I think it could be both. <laughs> hmm. And you'll see that uh, Tavarin pulls away from the console and reaches for his com badge. Uh, Lieutenant Tavarin to Acting Captain Abasi. Abasi here, go ahead. The sensors have detected some kind of chronometric signature emanating from the AZA system. Um, we do have some historiographic information about the system from contemporary, uh, well, uh, not exactly contemporary, but our contemporary period. Uh, but very little, I think, is going on there we may want to investigate based on the fact that, well, there's some kind of chronometric disturbance going on there. I'd agree. I see some merit to that. Lieutenant Troxian, let's set course. The system, so far as we know, is uninhabited, but we may wish to engage the cloak. Agreed. We'll do that before dropping out of warp. Very good, sir. I Would you like a roll we for should go to the navigating? bridge. Agreed. Uh, Lieutenant Alexio, could I speak with you for a moment before uh, we depart? Uh, well, yes, I'm all ears. And for a son or Lord, get the hint and leave you two yeah. alone for a bit. And uh, Thavarin will walk over the table, finish off his drink, and then say... Listen, Lieutenant, um, I know on duty I'm a bit of a stick in the mud, but um, if ever you want to talk about how you're feeling about Starfleet and your role in it, um, I'd be happy to do that. Hmm. Well, um, 
If you introduce me to this intestine melting drink of yours, I am sure you'll you'll get uh, quite a bit out of me. Speaking of which, do you know any Andorian drinking songs? Uh, I know more Klingon drinking songs than I do Andorian drinking songs. Then I'll have to introduce you to some of the ones that my father taught me. Mm, fascinating. And with that, I think uh, Thavarin would walk out. And now his posture is suddenly sort of ramrod straight, and he looks like mm. this, the, precisely like the stick in mud that he always u- is. All right. That. This guy is more interesting than he lets on. I love it. I love it indeed. All right. So we're now going to cut to the bridge of the Bastet. Uh, so as you all sort of come onto the bridge uh, and Droxine, you've already set the ship to get the uh, Bastet uh, in the system fairly quickly. Um, everyone sort of begins their own way of an- analyzing what is going on here. So my question is, um, who would ta- like to take the lead here? Um, that way we don't have like eight people rolling for the same mm-hmm. thing. So who would like to take the lead here is the question. I will make the scans. Okay. So uh, you're going to be doing your own reason science. Uh, you're doing, again, a sensor science on the ship. The difficulty on this, strangely, is now a two instead of a one. I'm on to your tricks, you bitch. Well, I got it. Could I? Oh. <laughs> well, I guess I'll just roll my dice then. Mm-hmm. No, no, spend a, spend a momentum so that you can uh, roll for untapped for potential. Untapped potential. Oh, good point. Hey, I'll do that. You also have cautious science, I believe. I do. I do, I do, I do, sir. Oh, man, somebody reviewed everyone else's character sheets. He's really good at that. He, uh, he catches me on October sometimes, which is great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and if you really want, you nice. can uh, re-roll that zero if you want to shoot for extra successes. Do I? All right, let me do reason and science with the focus. Here comes the complication. All right, hey, no complication, hey! but uh, that's still five successes, so you guys are uh, up to five momentum total. Uh, Hater. Yeah, and you get to roll the... Yeah, um... Now roll your challenge dice. All right, challenge die. Oh, I get threat. Nice. Nice to Yay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to give, where are you? There's Cater. All right. So there I've given you access to the sensors handout. Uh, and then I'm going to give everybody access to the database handout so that you have a point of reference. <laughs> uh, Captain, so it's a binary star system with two class K suns around a borderline class M dwarf planet. Ah, uh, let's see here. It looks like there's, wow, only four life forms aboard on the planet. They appear to be biomechanical in nature between the size of maybe a runabout or, or like a Bassett's entire alpha section. And if the sensors are correct, there's like some active energy weapons fire originating from each of the four life forms directed towards the others. Uh, the technology is chroniton based, sir. Can we get better readings of these mechanical life forms? No, but there appears to be some extensive ruins over the planet. Um, the only structure left standing is in danger of being destroyed by the uh, aforementioned weapons fire I'm picking up. Um, it appears that the weapons fire is interfering with my sensors as well. I think it would uh, warrant getting a closer look at this. What's everyone else's thoughts on this? Uh, I said we go check it out. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Well, Captain, we do know that Starfleet Temporal Prime Directive suggests that we cannot get involved, even if this is a means for us to get home. If there's even the slightest chance of us intervening in this conflict, we can't take that chance. Ugh, I can't believe I'm about to agree with Lieutenant Tavarn, but I also don't think we should go check out the thing that was happening regardless of whether we're here or not. But Lieutenant, you might just actually make a captain. Mm-hmm. Counterpoint. And... Counterpoint, Captain, if I may. Um, it, it, we can't interact with it, per se, with Starfleet regulations, but we could go look and maybe learn something. Just my two cents. And, you know, I'm just a doctor. 
And uh, Mir actually speaks up from one of the science stations and says, uh, hold on, hold on. Everybody look at this. And on the view screen, she puts up a side-by-side -side picture. Uh, on the left, you see what is essentially this sort of brown dirt ball of a planet. On the right is the current image of the planet that is in the system you're now entering. And she goes on to explain, I mean, I mean, look, look, it, the, the suns are right, but the planet's not. I mean, it, it's a class L dwarf planet, not a class M. It's supposed to be class L. And it's not even supposed to be terraformed until 2379. Why is it a class M here? Can we cross-reference the readings from our database with the chronological chronotons of this planet and see if maybe it's a planet out of time? I don't know where that came from. Just throwing out ideas. You hear Tamarochka as your spirit animal say, good job, you have thought ahead. Oh, good job. But yeah, I mean, if uh, if you want to take a look at it from that sort of perspective, why don't you roll me an insight and science at a difficulty of two? I can do that. Cater, insight. Uh, team, can I use at least one momentum? Do you mind? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Insight, science? Yep. All right, gotcha. Um, I'm sensor operating, so you are. yes. Cool, All right. Insight, science with a focus 3d20 is the ship helping here it's two uh no this is simply just cater okay uh didn't look like it rolled your third die there i got it i got it, I got it, I got it. all right got all right, right three successes back. you get that momentum back roll for your untapped potential Ooh. all right so you're capped on momentum now very nice Thanks. yeah cater your hunch is correct if the volume of weapons fire that is chronometrically based is, well, to put it simply, if they're firing that much energy around and it's chronoton based, it, it would easily destabilize the planet's quote unquote natural timeline very quickly. Uh, Captain, uh, based on my sensor readings, I think my hypothesis was correct. Um, the weapons fire is messing with the planet's timeline. So technically, even though Starfleet says we can't go and mess with it, technically it's not even in its own timeline. So really, we're not messing with this timeline. That's totally a loophole we can play with. Computer, right? give me a list of the uh, right. the reports uh, about Ed Aradani uh, in chronological order, uh, by title only. All right. So it basically shows a survey record in 2352, where they first sort of looked at the planet. Then you see in 2369 uh, that it was uh, tagged for possible terraforming. And then actual terraforming began somewhere in the neighborhood of late 2369, 2370. And uh, it was projected or is projected to be completed with your terraforming operation in uh, 2379. Other than that, no other record of there being life on the planet, no other record of any civilization on the planet, no structures, nothing of the sort. But more importantly, there's no record of ships having come here and seen that there's the, a planet that is just uh, a barren ball of dirt consistently between, he, between now, 2268 and 2369. Correct. We've got, got, got 101 years of window here to, to not know anything about this place. Correct. All right. Uh, in which case, so I, Captain, I've consulted the records and it looks like there aren't any Starfleet reports about this system. Um, so, uh, I mean, in the interests of getting home, there may be something to learn here. However, I still advise against interfering in any of these events because the only logical conclusion is that they'll, they already took place and they will conclude however they're going to conclude and leave the system in the state it's found in, in 2369. And there's a possibility that we were involved, so let's check it out. Time travel. I think we should move in, get a closer look at this. With the chronoton discharges, this might give us something we can use to try and get home. 
I do want to avoid any contact with these four life forms if we can avoid it. Recommend Hi, we sir. go to Cloak, sir, if we haven't already. Bring the cloak bring the cloak online before we approach the planet. As you wish, sir. And uh, Varessa hits a button and the ship goes to blue alert as the cloak is engaged. Cool. And yeah, I'm going to skip ahead just a tiny bit uh, to when you're in orbit of the planet itself. And yeah, again, it's a class M world. So lots of blues, lots of greens. Uh, maybe it's like a miniature Earth with just a little bit less water. Uh, but it's at this point that uh, Tavarin, um, I would like you to take the charge here. And I'm doing this to give everybody hopefully some good uh, screen time. Um, I'd like you to roll me a insight and a security here uh, to represent uh, sort of you looking at the weapons fire and seeing what you can glean from it. And uh, what would be the difficulty there? Uh, difficulty is only a one here. Okay. Um, I'll buy one extra die, and okay. I will. I presume that my shipboard tactical systems focus would apply. Most definitely, yes. All right. So you get the momentum right back and uh, untap potential. Let's see if you get anything there. All right. So you actually have one floating momentum for uh, potentially asking me a question. So remember how it was said that these life forms are biomechanical? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to fire the amount of energy that they're doing, they have to have somewhere in the neighborhood of like a miniature warp core powering them. So a not insignificant feat. Uh, and I don't mean like a shuttle sized warp core. I mean more like um, like an Antares class or a uh, like a an actual like space faring vessel, not just like a runabout kind of thing. Um. So you don't know of any creature like there. There's no creature that you know of that has such a power source in it. With that free momentum, um, do the energy signatures of these creatures correspond with any known power systems? So for instance, the, the Iconians or the Takan surely could have come up with some kind of system akin to this, like a miniaturized warp core. Um, do we see any correlation between the energy signatures of these creatures and something that we have a record of? Yes, in fact, you do. And your guess was almost right on the money. Um, you are seeing that the power signature could be Takan based. Hmm. Captain, I've done some preliminary analysis of the uh, the plasma energy signatures of the uh, the warp systems or power systems of these techno-organic creatures, I think we might be dealing with some kind of remnant from the Takan Empire. The Takan? I don't think I'm very familiar with them. Uh, they were, if you'll check your feed, I'll upload a uh, historiographical uh, database entry on the Takan. In short, they were another one of those ancient, almost omnipotent empires that uh, were running about the galaxy hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, they had the ability to transport entire solar systems across the galaxy using massive stellar transporters. And then, for some reason, they disappeared. Hmm. That's potentially troubling. Can we get any readings off of these creatures to figure out if do they have a chronoton signature that's out of place themselves? I tell you what, if you give me a momentum, I will answer that question. I think over. it's worth it. Worth it. All right. Yes, they are temporally displaced. But it's very odd. And by odd, I mean some of them look like they are from the past. Three of them in particular seem to have a past signature to them. One of them, however, is from the future. Or at least the future even past your time. 
And who are they firing at? Like, are they just firing at each other? Yeah, they're just sort of shooting at each other. Are three of them firing at the one from the future? Yep, you got it. Mm -hmm. Captain, given the fact that these are not from this time period, and they have the ability to manipulate the time stream, and in fact, that's probably what they're doing right now, we may not actually be under the constraints of the Temporal Prime Directive. I'm leaning towards agreeing with that. But the question is, at this point, what do we do? Fly and, in there and kick some past to con ass. Right? Because we want to go to the future with the future guy. And he needs to survive the firefight. Oh, I really felt like the whole room would be with me on this one. I support this decision. That sounds cool. I would suggest we try to mediate a peaceful solution to their conflict in accordance with the dictates of Federation policy. I don't think Federation policy dictates that you try and talk into the middle of a firefight. Actually, I would be it more does. inclined to agree with Tavaran here. We don't know who the good guys or the bad guys here are. If we back this future man, as we're calling him, he might turn around and, and kill us. He might be the aggressor. Well, so we disable weapons on all of them. I, I think that's... I can thread that needle. As long as they can't hurt us, we can sort out the good guys and the bad guys then. To that point, Bed for us speaks up and says, well, while everyone was, um, I don't want to say arguing, because that's not really the word for it, but um, you're going to want to see this. I think you'll find it rather amusing. And uh, you see that she's actually launched a probe into the atmosphere without being asked to, so maybe Absy might have something to yell at her later about. But uh, with the probe in the atmosphere... Uh, it sort of zooms down from the clouds, and what you see is essentially a war-torn landscape where you're seeing, strangely, you're seeing a series of trenches that would suggest that there was some form of an in infantry presence. And the probe sort of flies around in what is howling wind and rain that is causing the mud and the dirt and the cinders and ashes of this world to more or less sort of congeal and form into just this gray and black mess. Um, but as it does, a large looming figure uh, emerges from out of the uh, sort of miasma around it. And it is what is essentially a biped but with wings and claws and a design which i'm just going to tell you out of character it's a dragon with guns on it that's awesome i say that in character <laughs> so that's the first one you see and as the probe continues to sort of fly around the area as it sort of follows where the weapon fire is directed and all that you see another uh this one is smaller slightly smaller um, and it is a bit more organic where the other one was more like a, a hybrid between, you know, maybe 50, 50 organic mecha. This one is definitely more like 75, 85% organic. And then there's a third one, uh, extremely small compared to the other two. Uh, this one is almost entirely mechanical. And then as the probe begins to fly towards where all of their weapon fire is located, um, you see the following creature about the same size as that second one. And it is, uh, I mean, when I say it's from the future, it's not just because it is. It also is a little more sleek. Uh, it has a bit more of that sort of future feel to it, that aesthetic of, you know, clean, white curve kind of things. And uh, yeah, that is everything that you guys see on the view screen at the moment. We should back that one. It looks the coolest. Sorry. I reiterate, Wait, why do we have any to... of you graduate from the Academy? Why do we have to back any of them at all? 
I'm a little apprehensive about getting into the middle of this without really knowing what's going on. Captain, do you remember when uh, permission just to to bring up a thing that we talked about earlier? Speak freely. Do you remember when um, Tamarochka was telling us about uh, the Defiance way of beaming through time? What were the particles that she said we should get uh, embedded in our blade of hull plating? Chronoton. So why would we why would we not just in, just fly through their weapons fire, in embedding chronotons into our our plating? We'll leave whatever's happening out there to happen out there. Uh, just pick up some spare chronotons for what we need them for, and then uh, we should be able to figure out a way to uh, to use those. Uh, in fact, if we reconfigure the Bussard scoops, we can actually, since we're not using them to go to warp at the moment, we could probably scoop up a whole bunch of them and store them for future use, even if we don't manage to in, embed enough of them into the, uh, the hull plating to affect the same um, uh, design as the USS Define used to, to beam through time. Counterpoint. But if we befriend one of them, we can get all the chronoton particles we want. Also, and hear me out, we would have a cool dragon friend. Potentially interfering with the timeline. Potentially, but it's only a potential. Whereas my way has no potential of interfering with the timeline. And listen, I don't suggest not messing with the timeline easily. You remember when we first got here and I was like, whatever it takes to get home. But now I'd like to have a home to get back to. That's fair. Abbasi the siren kind of... goes in the background. <laughs> Sorry. You're fine. Abbasi, Abbasi just kind of sits there staring at the view screen for a few minutes uh, before turning to look towards Lieutenant Tamarochka. Would you be able to modify the Bassard collectors to gather ambient chronoton particles? I could do such a thing, but you are realizing you're asking me to modify ship to fly in between massive beams of energy. You're, you're essentially asking a pilot to do pinpoint maneuvering and um, not scratching paint or otherwise flying us into beams, yes? I got you. Yes, I'm aware. All right, I just wanted to make sure that you are uh, aware of such. Yes, I can begin again work right, right away. Can we try contacting them, Captain? Just, oh, permission to speak freely. Sorry. Uh, it's, I would like to try contacting them first. Yeah. If that does not work, we need an alternative, and I want that ready. Especially if they turn on us just for trying to contact them. Cool, I'm going to contact the, the shiny one, and I try to open a channel. Okay. Yeah, you open a channel. What uh, what do you say, or do you let the captain speak? Uh, channel open, captain. Uh, this is Captain Abbasi of the Federation, of a Federation starship. Do you require assistance? And the three that you saw initially do not reply, but uh, the voice that comes from the fourth one um, simply says, I don't have much time. If you can hold them off for another five minutes, I can get to a place where they won't be able to hit me as easily. Can you do that? It's a creature in distress. Starfleet protocol. We got to help it. Let's do it. That's not... We can give you what we can. Yeah. All right. So. Oh, so much for not interrupting the timeline. <clears throat> with that, I think we're going to take our uh, five to ten minute break. As when we come back, you're going to be doing a little bit of shooting, a little bit of flying, and uh, we'll see what happens. But yeah, we'll be back in about uh, five to ten minutes. So stick around.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, if you're just tuning in, the long and short of it is, uh, well, the Bastet found dragons. Dragons with temporal guns using uh, on one another. And they're going to swoop in and try and help one of them for reasons that are nebulous. But hey, it's a TOS era plot, so you got to have TOS era hijinks. So uh, we sort of see an external view of the Bastet uh, angling down into the atmosphere of the planet. And uh, it's one of those things where uh, Droxine, uh, both you and Relure, are your fingers are just dancing across the console as you both sort of uh, almost pigeon speak to one another in a like a a, a pi in like a pilot like language that hey you need to do this and do this and tailor the the impulse engines this way but you have it in like shorthand so you're not like wasting words. And to everyone else, they have no idea what you guys are talking about, but the effects are immediate. That your entry into the atmosphere is nice and smooth. Um, however, when you break the cloud layer and enter into the combat field, this is where I'm going to start needing actual action checks and where we actually are going to go into initiative order. So the players do get to go first. What would you guys like to do first? So I'll take the first action. I'd like to do initial sensor scan to create an advantage for our weapons. Okay. To reduce their difficulty task, which I okay. believe is a difficulty. I guess you said it. You would set the difficulty. It's, I just want to assist, basically. Or no, scan for weakness. Reason yeah, and I was going to say, I think that's a scan for weakness. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm trying to find it in the Klingon book real quickly here. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, difficulty three, uh, sensors and security, uh, reason and science with a difficulty of three. So did I will they, go ahead and get that. Did it? I don't think it was always three, was it? That can't be right. Hold on. Whatever one I have, but please, if it's, if it's lower, go for it. I won't argue. Uh, I, th I think it's dependent on range. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay, so I'm going to say that they are at a uh, close range at this point. Um, so it's actually only a difficulty of one, but you are correct. It is a control science and it is assisted by the ship's sensors security. Science sensor security check. All right. Well, there's already one success on the board. All right. Two. So you get a point of momentum. Yeah, uh, which of the three or four potentially do you want to scan for weakness here? I would like to give you a momentum, so if it's okay with the crew, uh, everybody, to know which one is the biggest threat, like which one seems to be firing the most chronicon particles. That would actually be the smallest one. Uh, then I want to mess up that one. Okay. So uh, as you scan the most mechanical one, you pinpoint a few of its joints, which don't seem to be somewhat well designed, or at least it's not meant to be load-bearing or take a whole lot of punishment, if you get my meaning. I will. But, uh, does anyone have quick to action? No. Alright, well, that means that if you want to keep the initiative, the cost is two. Otherwise, it's going to go to one of the uh, enemies here. All right, so we're going to go to one of the enemies. Uh, in particular, the largest one is going to kind of see the Bastet swooping in, is going to turn, angle its cannons, and they adjust, and a bright prismatic beam fires out from them towards the Bastet. Uh, yes, so what's going to happen is the Bastet, uh, you're going to take nine damage. Now that is reduced by your ablative armor. So that goes down to, I believe, a value. You have six armor, so you only take three damage. However, um, because the special effect of the cannons is in play here, and I rolled an effect, something interesting happens. So as the prismatic beam uh, sprays across the shields, um, you know, you you there's a little bit of bumpy, you know, a bit of a bumpy ride for a moment. But what happens is you see that the entire landscape changes it right before your eyes. Um, specifically, that 
the landscape seems to be reverting to an earlier state. So you're seeing trees becoming back from being ash. You're seeing the trenches and the dirt sort of returning to a natural state, more to like actual fields rather than, you know, dug trenches. And you're also starting to see what might be the hints that there are buildings that are rebuilding themselves, as it were. And what I would say is that you do know immediately that the chronoton weapons, when it hits you, it does seem to be messing with your objective sense of reality. Huh. But that is the enemy's Ooh. turn. Uh, it is now back to the players. Shoot the little one! Question Captain. for you. Nope. Sorry, just I a was... question. ELH, it was yes. three points of damage? Yeah, it was three points of damage. So you should be at uh, 17 shields. 17, yeah. Captain, I might be able to modulate the shields uh, to to give us some uh, a, bit, a bit of an edge against the next attack, unless you you'd rather we open fire. No, go ahead, <clears throat> modulate the shield as best you can. I'd rather not open fire on them. I'd rather just keep their attention long enough for the one we're assisting to find a space to get away from them. All right. So I'd like to try to, to, to do a modulate the shields roll then. Certainly. That is going to be uh, one cost of power, so do note that down. Should but we uh, it is also going to be a control security assisted by the ship's structure engineering uh, difficulty of two. All right. And um, I am going to spend one momentum. Okay. That's fine. And the best that's really pulling her weight today. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have any a couple focuses here. It may also be helpful to us to uh, get put the ship between whoever mm -hmm. we're helping and the other one. Very nice. Well, that oh, nice, uh, nice, not bad. Yeah. So don't forget to roll untapped potential here because that is a, a total of five successes at the moment. And uh, my challenge die. All right, I get a point of threat. So oh. you are capped on momentum at this point with three floating by my count. Or no, with one floating. I can math. Um, um, so yeah, uh, what I would say is the way modulate shields works is you immediately get one resistance more and then an additional resistance for every momentum you spend. And this oh, lasts so we... until the shields take... Uh, damage past resistance, so they they have to get through your resistance and deal at least one damage to get rid of this resistance. So I think we should definitely spend the floating momentum for that, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe one additional. So hear me out. Let's spend it all. Okay. All but one, maybe. All can but we, one. Can we compromise on that. On one. Go bigger, go home. Let's go bigger, go home. We're going okay. all in. Let's do it. <laughs> I feel like we don't have any cards yet, though. Why would we go all in now? We're going all in. Baby. That's like going all in before the before the the, the flop. Yeah, no. they haven't even dealt. We're going all in. All right. Well, welcome uh, to poker night. Yeah. All in. I think. <laughs> okay. So let me do the math on that. Let's see. So that's seven. So your resistance is now thirteen. Congrats. You are hard as hard to hit as a board cube. Congrats. <laughs> Well, then I don't need to fly the ship anymore. You guys just removed my entire purpose for being here. We could, just park the, we could just park this thing on the ground and they still wouldn't be able to hit us. Ugh. I like sure the imagine. resistance is your good flying. Come on. Like, it's not all just the modulation. Like, you're flying, you're dipping, you're diving, you're doing what pilots do, you know, whatever that is. <laughs> Trust the doctor to not know. All right. <laughs> I like to say that probably actually happens in character, that little exchange. <laughs> yeah. Like, all of that, totally in character. But yeah, uh, that's going to be your guys' turn, and I think the small one is going to fire at you anyway. Uh, will actually miss you with its own prismatic beam. And that means it's now back to you guys. What would you like to do? 
somebody should fire. No, we're not gonna. We're not firing. I forgot about that. I'll move the ship to be between whichever the one is that we're helping. Does anybody even know? Captain, may I make a suggestion? Oh yeah, it's the it's the one that Derwolf uh, hailed. Right, I remember now. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Captain, yeah. if I might make a suggestion, well, I understand you do not want to engage them directly. If we were to blast the ground with a with a phaser fire, I believe we could create a, a shield of some kind with earth and dirt um, to give our ally more cover. Just a thought. Or we could use the ship. <laughs> you know, the big metal thing that we're in right now. I mean, plus that. Why not both? Is there... If we use our main deflector, try and trigger any residual chronotons on any of these other dragons, do you think we could cause a shift like like we read in the reports on the Defiant? Maybe get one of them to remove itself from this encounter. If we, we... blanketed the area with tachyon particles from the main deflector, we might be able to cause a chronometric inversion, Captain. Uh, but there's a also a chance that that, chrono, that chronoton inversion will catch us as well, and we could end up anywhere. Only if you fly us directly into it. Uh, the entire atmosphere is saturated with chronotons. I don't know how you're expecting that uh, reaction to be contained, but uh, if you have a theory about that, I would love to hear it. All we need to do is target the deflector. It's 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 a simple process. I can understand why you wouldn't under, you wouldn't understand how it works, but you know that the deflector faces the direction that we go, right? <laughs> Just so we're clear. <laughs> Lieutenant Droxine, just fly us. Lieutenant Thavarin, modulate the deflector. Let's try this. So, Thavarin, this is going to be a daring, and I'm debating whether to make it security or science or engineering. Uh, let's go with a daring engineering on this one. Uh, daring engineering, uh, the ship will assist you with a... Let's do a structure engineering on this one. And then uh, difficulty on this, I'm going to set at a three. I say, okay. would this count as a direct task from me? Yeah, I say if you wanted to count as your direct, you certainly may. So you would be assisting with a presence that. command. I will give you a threat to buy an extra die since we don't have any momentum. Okay. And uh, <laughs> he says uh, with no feeling. <laughs> would shipboard tactical systems apply since this is the deflector dish? Or I'll give it to you. Okay. And Dude, would focus. any of my focuses work on well, this? Let's take a look. Uh, I would say potentially. Actually, no, I don't think you have a focus yet. Just actually, no, maybe warp field dynamics. I could see maybe working in your case. Can I use it then? Yeah, go for it. The Varn on fire. All right, so that is another five successes. So you get uh, two momentum and go ahead and roll your untapped potential. That's it. Hey, look at that. You're up to, uh, <laughs> up to another three momentum. Very nice. So yeah, what happens is uh, Tavarin, uh, you manage to swoop in. Or with Droxine swooping in, you fire out the deflector beam. Um, it's more of a, an amber hue that comes from the deflector. And it sort of washes over, um, well, let me ask this, because you do have momentum now. If you give me two momentum, I'll say it will affect an area rather than just one target. And I do have the talent All Fingers and Thumbs, which gives me a bonus momentum when I use a bridge console. Ooh. So that can't be saved to the group pool, but I could spend that along with one of our uh, momentum pool to create that effect. And I'd mm -hmm. like to do that if that's all right with you. Yeah. Goodbye me. Completely fair. So the orange sort of beam lances out and washes over uh, the three aggressors or the presumed aggressors almost like a wave. And they don't quite wink out of existence so much as they sort of Thanos themselves and they sort of disappear from view. Uh, and you come to what I assume is a stop or at least a stationary like position near the other one, the one that hailed you, or the one you hailed, and replied. 
And uh, it actually kind of flaps its wings and moves to land on the front part of the saucer section. This is not to scale, of course. Like, comparatively, if I were to shrink him down to actual size, he would be maybe the side of a Bussard collector, or Bussard collector, maybe. So he's still big, but he's not, like, super big. And uh, it's actually one of those things where you don't actually have to look at the view screen. Like, it, act, if there were windows there, he would just be looking at you through the windows kind of a do thing. We, do we have the bridge skylight? So we can yeah, just, like, I imagine that's maybe it? what it is, is. Maybe he's, like, <laughs> looking in. Uh, you just sort of look up and you see that eye kind of leaning in and looking at you. And, uh, yeah, you're actually getting a hail from him. Uh, on screen? Jesus. And uh, the individual, whoever they are, says, Well, you're interesting. I haven't seen bipeds like you in, well, I, I don't know how long. Uh, thank you for the assist. Uh, whatever you did, it probably won't last long. Uh, we are sort of known for our ability to unshift ourselves from temporal problems, but uh, perhaps introductions are in order. Uh, I am known as Zaid. And I'll put his nameplate on so that you can see how it's spelled. Uh, it's nice to meet you, Zaid. I am Captain Abasi of the USS Bastet. Can you maybe fill us in on what we happened across? Well, uh, let me ask this. Uh, how familiar are you with the Takan? We're... We have records of the Takan. Mm. So you are from what would be my past. Interesting. Well, to summarize it in a way that uh, won't ruin anything, if you get my meaning... Let's just say that there are people in your future that don't like how the past unfolded. So they use Takan technology to try and, quote-unquote, fix things in their favor. You know, Abasi just kind of looks away and looks towards the other members of the crew that are on the bridge. How far into the future if you are willing to tell us 29th century oh huh which now that I get a good look at you you don't belong here you belong in the 24th century uh, that's correct is actually the chronoton signature that drew us here. We're looking for a way to get home. Hmm. Well, I can't promise I can help with that because even looking at the records, I don't show your vessel, at least in any Federation records, being in either this time or in 2376. So... You're completely out of time. Somehow you have a completely objective view of time, which is odd. That shouldn't happen. Wait. What? An objective view of time? I. You mean we exist outside of time? Yes, that's what I'm implying, is you are somewhat immune to the effects of it. No, 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 no. See, because I'm supposed to be on the Enterprise E in like five days. That I can't, I can't exist outside, of, Captain. I, Captain, I can't exist outside of time. I don't know how any of us are supposed to exist outside of time. I. Well, do we shunt like to a different an reality where we don't exist? Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cross talk over you. What were you saying, Brian? Did we just shift to a? Uh, do we shift to a, a universe where we don't exist? But we're right here. We but we, we, we but we're in a universe where we never existed. Maybe this reality occurs at a slower time speed, which means it doesn't matter what we do here because we're not even affecting our own time. 
permission to be excused from the bridge. I have a headache. Oh, we might need you while we're still here in atmosphere. Uh, of course you will. Uh, Mr. Zane, uh, Dragon, sir, uh, quick question. Uh, the medical officer, Callos uh, here. Um, so can you help us get home? If I knew how to get rid of your objectivity, yes, I would be able to help you get home. But I don't understand how you acquired it in the first place. I don't even have that. Thanks anyway. Well, this is amusing. Does this mean we can do whatever we want without causing a temporal paradox? I mean... It sounds scary when you put it that way, but yes. Hardly seems like a bad thing. Tavarin has words on this. I can just see it on Matt's face. He's like, <laughs> he's debating saying something. I would actually like to direct this question to, to Zaid. Are you saying that there's no record of us existing prior to this temporal incursion? And there is that pause where, you know, maybe he's thinking, maybe he's processing. And he says, there is record of a Bastet, but it also seems that it was recorded missing before it arrived at Starbase K7 in 2376. At least in my version of time. That is where we were headed. So despite the status that we've obtained as temporally objective observers, like the prophets perhaps, who are unaffected by alterations in the timeline, we're not actually extracted from it. We still have a history, if not a, a future, that's affected by our influence on the timeline. Word of advice, if you do start messing with the timeline, again, your objective, you're not going to be totally affected by it, but if you are trying to get to a specific home, let's just say that it becomes a ball of yarn very quickly. You will cause more damage than, um, well, let's just say that a temporal explosion is the least of your concerns. What I'd like to do then is uh, create a data packet of the sensor scans we took of the anomaly that brought us back into the past in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would turn to the captain. Captain, may I share our sensor data regarding the incident that brought us here with Zaid? I don't know Perhaps why you're asking somebody. permission. No one else on this bridge does. <laughs> because I'm a Starfleet officer and I act like one. And send Rilor, the data. Rilor kind of yes. actually looks over at Droxine as Tavarin's sending the data and says, he's got you there. You, Buddy, I, I get it, buddy. Buddy, I get it. You want to be on the Enterprise-Z, but y you need to focus on the present, buddy. Look, the only person treating the captain like the captain is me. Uh, the medical officer is hailing things with no orders. Uh, the, the Romulan is sending uh, probes out to space, uh, and I'm the one with the bad rap. Cool, 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 cool. She reaches under her console and hands you a candy bar. You seem like you're hungry. Have a Snickers. Might I suggest to the medical professional, maybe some time in the holodeck, some rest and relaxation. You seem very on edge. As he chews the candy bar, <laughs> Tavar shoots the message over to Zaid. And Zaid kind of uh, leans back and it's almost like in a human fashion where he kind of rubs his draconic chin in thought and he goes hmm well that is interesting I was wondering what that was I meant to look into it the other day well as much as a day matters uh are you all familiar with the phenomenon known as the nexus yes well to put it plainly, your little plasma storm that you ran into, it was an offshoot of that. But anything I've 
read about the Nexus is any ships encountered have been destroyed. Well, congrats. You survived, which apparently gives you objectivity. And it's right about then that uh, Zade, his head sort of snaps up and looks in the distance and says, Yep, they're back. Uh, thanks for the assist, but uh, you probably should get out of here. I, you might be objective, but your ship isn't immune to everything. Thank you for sharing what you could with us. Right. Um, I can't really say anything more, but um, if you are departing, I wish you the best. And then the uh, the channel closes and Zade flaps their wings and disappears uh, into the rain and the mist. Bye, Dragon. Thanks for your help. Which uh, means we're going to go back to the bridge as you all digest what the hell just happened. Uh, Helm, get us back into orbit. All right, sir. Should I re-engage the cloaking device? Once we're out of atmosphere, bring it back online. Very good, Captain. So it takes you maybe five, ten minutes, if that, to get back up into the uh, orbit of the planet. And uh, the external hull shimmers out of view as you re-engage the cloaking device. And once the cloak's enabled, uh, Mir kind of turns and looks at Tavarn and says, So, um, what are your thoughts there, uh? Computer expert, buddy. Uh, seem like you have quite a lot in your mind. Too much for me to really articulate at this point. I mean, there's no record of us ever returning, and I don't know. I'm just... Talk to me when we're off duty. I can do that. And then it's at this point that R'hllor kind of turns and looks directly at Alexio and says you uh you, you don't seem thrilled oh thrilled is not the word i'd use but this is an exciting opportunity wouldn't you wouldn't you say and i just look around at the bridge crew and i'm like we may be amongst the most powerful beings in the galaxy right now. We aren't beholden to the way things played out necessarily. If we wanted to, we could change things for the better. Yes, Ooh, awesome. but- Abasi kind of looks over, hearing this. We're still Starfleet officers. Our responsibility is to try and not pollute the timeline. I'm sure now our responsibility is not to pollute the timeline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But what what's to say what's pollution and 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 what's medicine? I mean, we could save countless lives. If we want to do, we could we could fix things with our knowledge of, of, of the future, with the technology we have, which is far more advanced than what Starfleet has now. And at what cost? We'd be fools not to consider it. Lieutenant, we would be fools to believe that we have the foresight to understand the actual effects of any action we undertake in this time period. The, the consequences of even the smallest alteration are beyond contemplation. How is how, it twice I've agreed with Lieutenant Tavarn today? How do we ever know what the consequences of our actions are go, going to be? Even if we return to our own time, I could say we should do nothing because we don't know if uh, what we do here might cause someone to die in a galaxy far away. Uh, uh, that's that, that, that's a, an argument for for inaction all of the time. So as you're talking, Relora just slowly gets up and walks over to you, Alexio, 
And she kind of just reaches out and doesn't slap you, but kind of just taps the side of your cheek and says, it'll, it, it'll be okay, Alexia. Just, just breathe. I exhale. I was just trying to see if anything good could come out of this situation. And I, I just turn back to, um, my console and start poking at things. Mm -hmm. If I may, Captain, I wanted to apologize for doing things without asking. I, I realize I haven't been doing the best job following Starfleet protocol. With that being said, though, I, I think it's the epitome of hubris for us to think that there's no way in which we will affect the timeline. I mean, we're here. We've already affected it in some way. I think our mission, if we had one, should be to make the most minimal impact. And if we do impact it, try to find the best impact possible. I don't know if that makes sense. I guess what I'm it trying does. to say is I agree with you, Alexio, at least to some extent. I just want to say quickly out of character. I love how you guys have like made two different sides of this issue and you're like evenly split. So it's up to the captain to figure it out. I love it. <laughs> At this point, there is no telling if we really are. Well, if what was said is true, if we are objectively outside of time, from what we were told, it would appear so. But we should still exercise caution. Well, I, and this is Varessa, I do have an idea about how we could test that theory. What's your idea, Lieutenant? Well, let's just go get shot by one of those beams again. If we come out the other side and we're still standing and our records still indicate certain things then it might confirm the fact that we are objectively in time. And if I understand the modulations of the shields, whoever did this, by the way, is an absolute masterful bit of work here. I, th I think that we could probably withstand a full Borg assault with whoever modulated these shields. So well done there. Thank you, Marissa. It's not all shape-shifting for me. I did pay attention that day at the Academy. Well, um, I would just simply say that, um, and this might be me being a little bit of a fan girl, I believe is the expression, but this is, um, this is exemplary work. I haven't seen a modulating of shields like this. And well, and before I haven't seen it before at all. I just want to remind the crew that fraternization among officers is not prohibited, but discouraged. Thank I, you. I was just being nice. You don't have anything to worry, Doctor. Weird thing to bring up, but anyway. Uh, and Alexio actually kind of is, is blushing now, but mm -hmm. if... Um, is this what you want to do, Captain? Because I think that she's right. I think we could take a hit. I'm not sure what taking a hit from a chronoton weapon would prove. Uh, I don't know how that would prove our objective status and time, but... Tamaroshka the bridge. Go ahead, Tamaroshka. Did um, that shaking earlier, did we hit some sort of uh, temporal anomaly that you did not tell me about? We were hit by a chronoton beam. Ah, that explains why we are now in year 2151. This explains very much. We're where? Well, you know old era with um, Enterprise NX-01? Yeah, we are, we, we, are, we are basically three days before they launch. Uh, Droxine will run a scan using his focus on astronavigation to confirm her readings. Yeah, uh, go ahead and roll me a uh, Reason Con, assisted by the ship's sensors con. 
And uh, difficulty on this is a one. Uh, I mean, I'm going to spend a momentum only because uh, I haven't gotten to do anything all, all game. So Fair. if I want to, I want to spend a momentum <laughs> and get to roll a challenge dice. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think I have a focus for this. Yeah, I don't think you, that's the catch here. Is I don't think you have a focus. Well, you do get uh, your one success. Now you also get to roll your untapped potential. Yes. And it was sensors con. Sensors con from the ship. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, hey, I, I just threat. gave you a gel. Uh, threat. Nice. Yeah. No help from the bastard. So with the one success. Yeah, uh, you check the data, and you are indeed in 2151. Uh, you are, if you had to put an actual, like, physical date on it, you're, like, April 13th, 2151. Uh, Captain, I can I can confirm that. It looks like the uh, sensors check, uh, bear that out. We are in 2151. April 13th, to be exact. Cool. No, right. that's the wrong direction. So we are Peter, you're terrible. Still, still moving through time. Captain, this might actually present us with an opportunity. If those weapons cause us to move through time, perhaps we could use the sensor data that we've collected to remodulate the shields based on Lieutenant Alexio's expert skills in this area in order to determine how we would be moving through time. I agree. Let's analyze that data. All right. So this is going to be an impromptu extended task. Uh, basically, uh, one or more of you is going to be crunching the data, figuring out how to modulate the shields and whatnot. And I will type out the extended task so we have a record of it. So uh, the work track is going to be out of 12. Uh, the... Magnitude is going to be a four. The resistance on this is just going to be a two. And uh, it's not really timed or anything, so we don't have to worry about that. But the difficulty, what I would say, is going to start at a four. Now, uh, in terms of rolling, uh, this is going to be a daring and security or a daring and engineering and the ship would assist you with a structure and security on this one. I got the ship, but I probably shouldn't do any of the other stuff. Let's see. I have pretty good daring and engineering, so I could do the role for this. Okay. Captain taking initiative of himself. I love it. Would my yeah. focus in computer systems apply to this? I think it would, yeah. And in fact, uh, you know, you also have uh, Mir and I think, Alexa, you've got computers too, don't you? Or is it Tavarin that no. has computers? I, I do. Forget. Yeah. yeah, so you have at least Mir and Tavarin um, that could assist you on this as well. Could I send calming thoughts to his mind to help him focus with my telepathy? Um... I mean, I'm not saying no, but I don't know if that would be counted as an assist, more of just an RP fluff thing. Boom. I'm like, Captain Kitty. Go. Actually, you know the ship what? got you one. You know what? Because you called him Captain Kitty, I'm going to spend two threat to create the complication that now his complication range is an 18 to 20. Yes. <laughs> Hey, I gotta spend okay? the threat. I, I gotta be a little mm -hmm. evil. You have so For much. Sure. I love so, it. Is it okay if I use that one point of momentum we have yeah. for an extra die? I would actually recommend using that and a point of threat and your determination for this. Yes. Uh, in that case, let me tap my value. Be willing to do what yourself what you would ask of others. Yeah, I think that's a very good value to use here. So that would be four die in total? Uh, it would be three because your determination counts as already rolled a one. Right. And who's assisting with this? Would it be Lieutenant Mir, perhaps? Uh, well, let's have Tavarin. Let's have you do it. That way uh, we have focus on the main characters. So and that so is four successes for me then. Yep. So we're at five right now. So you are getting at least one momentum back. But let me check that zero. 
Uh, that zero is not a complication. Nice. Uh, Just so with Tavarin six, uh, or Tavarin's assist, that is a total of six. You have two momentum. So yeah, uh, Absy, if you now want to roll me a uh, six challenge die to represent the work you do here. Nice. Wow, that is significant. So uh, before spending any momentum to potentially negate resistance, you are at least doing six work. So would you like to negate resistance? Yes, I would. Okay, then you go up to eight work. And, and uh, oh, go ahead. Just untapped potential because he spent. Uh... Yep, we do need to see untapped potential. Okay, so no help either way. But yeah, uh, what's going to happen is, Abbasi, you kind of look at the numbers and you think, yeah, you know what? Uh, we've got three computer cores on this thing. They're actually working finally. Let's put them to good use. And uh, with Tavarn and the ship itself assisting you, you make uh, leaps and bounds where others might have taken days to crunch this. You do it in a span of maybe hours, if that. Um, you have a really good bead on where to go from here. Um, so what I would say is that you now have to repeat the process, this time at a difficulty of three. All right. And then do we still have that one momentum? Yep. I'm going to use that for another die. Okay. Nice. Yes. Yes. again. Very nice. All right. There's the three. And nice. there's another assist. Very nice. That is a total of five successes. Nice. And uh, the complication on that 19, um, I'm just going to bank for later because I like doing that for mystery purposes. But uh, with five successes, you get two momentum. And yeah, go ahead and roll me more challenge die here. Another six challenge die. All right. So what I would say uh, is if you give me, uh, I think it's the one momentum, you have completed the extended task. I'll give you that one momentum. All right. So yeah, uh, after... Wait, do we, wait, oh, do we even need to give you the momentum? Because we have eight of 12. Uh, the six effects minus two is four. That makes twelve of twelve. Right, but you need uh, you need Another three here. Yeah, so yep. you need okay. you need to do five or more cool, cool. to get the second breakthrough and the third breakthrough. So yeah, you have to either give me a momentum or to get rid of the resistance or a momentum to do an additional work. Nice. No, but thank you for asking. I I don't mind clarifying. But yeah, Abbasi, uh, you and Tavarin working together, uh, it's kind of a brain trust, if you will. You think that within a wiggle room of a few years, you think you can potentially go to any era if you were to be hit by those chronotonic weapons again. Or chronometric weapons again. And do we think we can control what era we're heading to? Let's just say that on a mechanic standpoint, you're going to be rolling a challenge die each time you get hit by the weapons. If you roll a one or a two, you go to the era you were shooting for. If you roll an effect, you overshoot it. If you roll a zero, you undershoot it, meaning you go into the past. I love that. I love that. But what I would also say is that you can only do this trick once. Once you do this trick, it's not going to work again. We'll probably blow out a few shield or, uh, generators. All right, so and by the looks of this, we may be able to set a course, if you will, when we get hit by one of these chronometric weapons can we do we have the ability to recreate the effects of the chronometric weapon ourselves it's 29th century technology it dealing with chronometric variables that we don't even have the science to explain let alone understand 
And Tavarn, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's not a lot aboard this ship that generates chronotons. We'd have to spend a long time doing it. Exactly. We we would need an entire team of engineers at Utopia Planitia if we wanted to modify the ship to produce those kind of chronoton particles. I would, um, simply, and this is Verissa again, I would simply add that um, the cloaking device does provide miniature amounts of chronotons. That's where the chronotons and the defiance of Blade of Ama came from, but um, on a ship like this, it would take probably a few months to build up enough chronotons to matter. And would that be of constant use? Uh, correct, yes. I mean, that may give us an additional shot, but I don't want that to... I don't think that's our primary focus. And I think at this, Relor and Mir just kind of turn to look at you, and then maybe the others follow suit, where everybody's eyes sort of fall upon you, Captain, as to what you order next. Bessie just kind of sitting there it, it, visibly just shaking his head as he's trying to just consider all the variables. Hmm. I don't I don't think we should rush headlong into this. If we if we hit another one of these chronometric weapons we can try and pinpoint a time to head to there's no guarantee it will send us where we want to go but this is our one shot captain we're not going to run into this we're not we're not likely to run into this kind of 29th century technology especially in 2151 ever again Droxine. I'd like to offer you a devil's deal. Oh, God. <laughs> As the outcast of the crew, I don't think you should offer it to me, but cool, let's go. <laughs> well, I'm doing this because you specifically have a value that I would like to call, call into play here. <laughs> I think I know what one you're talking about. Well, there's two, actually. There's I'm not even supposed to be here today, and there's I just want to get home to my girl, and we've established the girl is the Enterprise E. It's the Enterprise E. So what I would say, and again, devil's deal, I will give you a point of determination, meaning that, you know, until you spend it, you actually have two determination. Um, and that, again, persists through future sessions until you use it. If you act upon that value and immediately begin flying the ship towards the chronometric weapon discharge. Whew. I mean, everybody else on the bridge got to do a thing where they didn't ignore what the captain wanted to do and did their thing. Um, <laughs> just just throw Tavarn under the bus, you know. Just just throw him under the bus. Just Ooh, no, and the, the reason that uh, Droxine won't do it is because he genuinely does want to be a good Starfleet officer. That's why he wants to be a captain eventually, mm -hmm. uh, and he doesn't believe that acting in direct contravention of orders even if he thinks it's for the best is, or even in the absence of orders is the correct course of action for a Starfleet officer. God damn it. <laughs> and I think as you think that Relore actually looks at you with concern at first, but as you come to that realization, she actually just gives you a, a, a good smile. And then everybody still is looking at the captain. Uh, Devasi just kind of staring at the view screen for another few minutes. Can we detect weapons fire back on the planet? One moment, sir. That would be a that would be yes, but it is decreasing in volume. Sir, it's decreasing in volume rapidly. This is our only shot. Dun, 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 there may not dun, be another dun, dun, chance dun, dun. to do this. Set course. Let's try and intercept one of those beams. Aye, Captain. 
So, as we uh, see a cinematic shot of the uh, Bastet uncloaking and diving back into the uh, atmosphere of the planet, this time you are not making any pretense of a smooth journey, so even the inertial dampers are causing a little bit of a bumpy ride. And you scream towards the crossfire uh, just in time for your uh, buddy uh, to see you and sort of hail you and go, what the hell are you doing? And before you can reply, uh, one of the chronometric prismatic beams hits you. And it is now at this point that I am going to be rolling a challenge die here. Now, what I'm going to say here... I'm so excited. What I'm going to say... Oh, man. ...is that with the amount of threat I have, I can re-roll this as many times as I want. (laughs) Excellent. No. But in the interest of it being Christmas, and I want you all to not hate me, I'm only going to roll it a maximum of twice. Do it all the time. That's amazing. So uh, let's see what we get the first roll. Okay, so I'm actually going to spend a threat to re-roll that because I don't want you going even further back in time. (laughs) That would be funny, though. It would be funny. Okay, so what's going to happen is you're going to end up somewhere near 2376 but not 2376 in particular so to you all what happens is the planet actually rapidly ages and ends up becoming sort of this dark gray brownish ball the way it's supposed to be but at the same time you are flung away from the planet at high speeds uh and again the inertial dampers are freaking out and when everything sort of stabilizes uh, and everybody starts to get back up to their stations, uh, Lieutenant Mir reports, um, sir, we're not in the alpha or the beta quadrant anymore. We're, oh no, that's not good. Where are we? Well, um, you know, Cardassian space, right? Yes. You also know that there was this little thing called the Dominion War? Are we in the Gamma Quadrant? No, but we're kind of on the wrong side of the line. If We're, we're in the year 2374 at the moment, sir. Is our cloak still online? And Varissa kind of looks at it and goes... Um, technically, yes. I'm a little bit hesitant that it would work, especially against Dominion sensors. They are rather adept at piercing even modern cloaking technology, and we're using old Klingon tech, which is, um, not great. Uh, also, um, sir, I have some bad news. Uh, in 2374, I'm actually on a, I'm an ensign on a ship deployed to the Cardassian border, so, uh, we should I should probably not get anywhere near there. Druxine, I have an out-of-character question for you. What is the name of that ship? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's a good question. Asking Uh, for a friend, right? Asking for a friend. (laughs) Uh, It's the Raziel, the USS Raziel. The USS Raziel. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens to the Raziel in your history? Uh, Well, the Raziel, uh, one of its uh, nacelles gets damaged in a... um, in a skirmish and then it ends up uh parked at uh, t space nine for a bit in in order to repair its nacelle enough that it can make the trip back home and then that's how i ended up at utopia planitia for reassignment uh i worked at utopia planitia for a bit that's how i got my lieutenant bars Mm -hmm. uh and then uh, that's when i applied and got my posting to the uss enterprise e i see i see and what class is the raziel it's a um Whew, that's another good question. It's a Norway class. It's a Norway class. Mm-hmm. Well, when those of you who have access to the sensors look, nearby there is a Norway class that is being surrounded by two Jem'Hadar battle cruisers. And oh, look, it's named the USS Raziel. Look at that. <laughs> look at that. That's a good spend of threat. Yeah, let's just spend all the threat. There you go. It's the Raziel. It has been done. It is so good. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Sir, I, I have some I have some good news and some bad news. Uh, the good news is uh, uh, the ship that we don't have to worry about accidentally running into the ship that I'm posted on. 
uh, the, the bad news is that uh, that that's it. That's I'm I'm on that ship. Do you remember this happening? No, we, we never came this far into Cardassian space. We we had a skirmish on the border, and then our uh, left our port in a cell was damaged. Um, yeah, this isn't a thing that happened to me. Captain, if I may, I recommend that we intervene. Agreed. Shields up, awesome. red alert. All right. And yes! as uh, as you go to red alert, I think that is the perfect cliffhanger to end today's session. <laughs> <Yes>! <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully that was enjoyable. I, I tried to throw the spotlight yeah. onto uh, those who didn't have it so much in the last session. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you guys think? Are, are you enjoying uh, how things are unfolding? Absolutely. That's very, very much good. so. For sure. Yeah, I love it. Cool. I want to say that after the first episode, I did not uh, in, in did not picture that uh, Lieutenant Tavarn and I would be agreeing so much in this one. And yet, here we are. Hmm. <laughs> no, and I, I, again... You did agree I'll... a lot, and you also disagree a lot. I hmm. feel like it was like extreme poles. <laughs> like, either you were exactly on the same page, or you guys were like, you're an idiot and you should be a stuff the office <laughs> pretty much yep right yeah no and i i love that uh that sort of that polar shift there because it, it makes very clear lines and it puts abacy under pressure to well captain which mm -hmm. is to me a very interesting thing especially for a young officer like how do you respond to the uh trials of command kind of a thing but yeah cool all right, well, uh, before we sign off, uh, let me ask. So next week is the 26th. Uh, does anybody anticipate being out, or do we want to try and meet on the 26th? I should be available. I can do it. I'll be available. Yeah. Okay, then uh, we will see these lovely gentlemen on the 26th. Uh, it's Twitch, stick around for a little bit longer, but uh, YouTube, have a happy holiday, and we'll see you later, YouTube.